Listener Production. I will speak out for you, have your back, fight your corner every single day. Because tonight, people here and around the country have spoken and they're ready for change to end the politics of performance a return to politics as public service. The change begins right here because this is your democracy, your community and your future. You have voted. It is now time for us to deliver. Hey, Bencion here, and that was Sir Keir Starmer speaking earlier today after he and the Labour Party won Britain's general election in a landslide. Official results will be days or even weeks away, but it looks like the Labour Party has won more than 400 seats. The Conservatives, known as the Tories in Britain, are expected to win around 130 seats. Liberal Democrats, 60 plus seats, and Nigel Farage's startup party reform, more than a dozen. On those numbers, it would be the biggest defeat in the history of the Conservative Party and put an end to its 14 years in power in Britain. Outgoing Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is expected to quit as Tory leader tonight. King Charles has cleared two spots in his schedule to farewell him and to welcome incoming PM Labor's Sir Keir Starmer. Sasha caught up with Eleanor Harrison Dengate. That name might be familiar to you. She's the briefing's former senior producer and she's now based in the UK. Eleanor, it's been a while. Thank you so much for joining us on the briefing today all the way from the UK. Why have we seen this very strong result for Labor? Hello, Sasha. Uh, So I think there's two main reasons why. And one of them is that, well, broadly, the UK Conservative Party has been in a shambles ever since party gate. And so that was in 2021. And since then, You've just had this sort of roller coaster of, you know, Boris Johnson falling apart, Liz Truss's weird sort of 45 days in office, and then Rishi Sunak taking over after that. And he only took over in October 2022. So he hasn't been around for very long. And then on the other side of that is that you've got uh, a Labor Party that is headed up by Keir Starmer. And what he has managed to do is he's managed to move the party into the centre-left instead of the far-left, which was where it was under Jeremy Corbyn. And he's also managed to sort of get rid of the a lot of the sort of Jeremy Corbyn elements of the party. So you've got, uh, you know, left-wing Labour Party headed up by someone who's moving everything to the centre and then you have <laughs> the uh, Conservatives who are basically looking like a bit of a mess Nothing's going particularly well for them. Uh, And so you kind of end up with the current situation. And I guess the other part of all of this is that the Conservatives have been in power for 14 years. Even if Rishi Sunak was absolutely amazing, he's fighting against all of that, plus that sort of time for a change kind of feel in the country because they've been in for so long. Look, what do we know about the new PM, uh, Sir Keir Starmer? Who is he? What I found really interesting was his biographer actually almost wanted to call um, his autobiography the unpolitician because he's just so not like similar to the current politicians we have, you know, these days, like people like sort of Boris Johnson or even like Tony Blair, where they've got that real sort of showmanship getting people out. Like people don't really seem to be very inspired by Keir Starmer at all, but he seems to basically be this sort of technocrat. He was brought up working class, Uh, And then he was a very successful lawyer. He became chief public prosecutor. He was actually knighted in 2014. So we should be saying Sir Keir Starmer. Then he became a Labor MP in 2015. And then he was, you know, in Labor while Jeremy Corbyn suffered that defeat. And then he sort of came to power. So the thing about Starmer is he's kind of this sort of quite a small target, I guess, because he's he's not, you know, particularly flamboyant or anything, but that sort of seems to be working for him, I guess. Yeah. Uh, something else I found interesting about him is that 
uh, he has chosen or he says that as PM he won't be working Friday nights, like putting aside this time for his family instead. Uh, It's not very politician-like, is it? And do you think maybe that's part of the attraction for some voters who are kind of sick of either, you know, the the bumbling fool we saw in uh, Boris Johnson or, you know, the, the polished conservative leader that we got from Rishi Sunak? He's actually making sure that the press don't actually know the faces or the names of his children. He really wants to keep them completely out of the spotlight. And he's also focused, obviously, on on family and sort of said it's important to spend time with family because for he himself, it seems like one of his big regrets is uh, not uh, having a better relationship with his dad because when he grew up, his mother was very sick. His brother had learning disabilities. His dad was spending a lot of time dealing with all of that. Uh, and that sort of relationship by the sounds of things wasn't, I guess, as strong as it could have been. And, and that was sort of, I guess, one of the regrets that came through in the autobiography. And so he's decided that he wants to focus on his family and make sure that doesn't happen with his kids. Mm. Look, as you said, the UK has had a conservative government for 14 years. What can we expect from a Labor-led Britain? The UK just hasn't been going that well economically for a while. And, you know, there was sort of really big difference between, you know, the last 14 years and then the 14 years before that. So if you were around the 14 years before 2010 in the UK, you saw massive growth and then it's really, really dropped off in the last 14. So you get this sort of sense that things have been stagnating. And so then with Keir Starmer, he's not going to go crazy. He said he isn't going to do heaps of spending. He's going to be careful about it, but he does want to change planning laws. He does want to get, you know, more infrastructure built, more houses built because just like Australia, you know, they have a a housing crisis here. He's also very into uh, creating a big clean energy plant here. So that sort of would be a major sort of infrastructure spend. So you've got sort of those elements. Uh, And then the other thing is that he's pledged to cut uh, NHS waiting times. He wants to add an extra, I think, 40,000 health appointments each week. And that's been a real problem sort of across the board. All the parties have been talking about fixing the NHS. And then the other couple of things that are really important to him is uh, migration, uh, where he's going to sort of set up his own patrol command to deal with the immigrants that are sort of coming across in boats from France. There are about 30,000 a year. And obviously Rishi Sunak's plan was to send them all to Rwanda. Uh, And the uh, Labor Party has said that they definitely won't be sending people to Rwanda. Look, we've spoken about Labor. At the end of the day, this result is a huge defeat for the Tories, for the Conservatives in the UK. What can we expect to see happen with them in the wake of this result? One of the things that's been quite sort of bizarre about the whole campaign has been, you know, Rishi Sunak having to sort of tell people that he's definitely not going to go to California and he definitely has plans to stick (laughs) around after the election, even if he's defeated. You get that kind of sense of like he's sort of already packed it in and then, you know, there's sort of these other elements that you hear about where apparently the Tory MPs were taken off guard by his decision to have the election today because, you know, it's summer in the UK and they all want to be in Greece. So, You sort of get this sense that basically they all were sort of taken a bit by surprise. Rishi Sunak really didn't expect to win and they're going to go and take this massive loss. And then I guess the idea would be probably a little bit like the, you know, Liberal Party in Australia is probably working on sort of building themselves back up again and, and gaining that credibility. And I think, you know, one of the things that the Conservatives actually really suffered from was when Liz Truss came in, uh, for the first time in years, you had polls saying that voters uh, were trusting the Labor Party with the economy more than the Conservative Party, which is quite unusual. And so I guess, you know, them coming back from the opposition, they'd be trying to sort of build, uh, build that credibility back up again. Do you think the British people will feel, I don't know, a sense of hope or excitement or like a new beginning with this result? We see that when you have one party that's been in control for a very long time, things start to go not so well for them, especially when it comes to things like the economy, which the UK has been suffering with. Then you get this new party come in. It almost feels like a sense of of a new dawn. 
are we going to see that in the UK or is it, are they a bit more jaded with what's been going on because it has been so contentious and so fraught over the last few years? To be honest, I don't get any sense of people being excited about Labor coming into power. And I think it's back to that issue of Keir Starmer isn't particularly inspiring. And while Rishi Sunak isn't particularly inspiring himself, he's not, he doesn't seem to be a horrible person. So there's not anything there either. And I think also there's this sense of um, the UK voting system is really weird. And this is one of those elements where I actually find myself very patriotic about (laughs) being Australian because you have non-compulsory voting. So here where I am in Dorset, uh, the last local election had this terrible turnout of like 20%. Um, And then you've got the first past the post uh, system, which is basically like you know, there's no preferential voting. If I, for example, voted for the Greens in my electorate in Australia and the Greens got 18%, well, those votes just wouldn't count if, you know, the Liberal Party got 25%, I don't know, and Labor got 20%, something like that. So that sort of thing is happening here. And then you're starting to get the people talking about, you know, wanting proportional voting, which is, I guess, like the popular vote that they sort of always talk about in the US where you're wanting like the whole national vote and then to sort of coordinate up like that. So you're getting these sort of elements where I guess people are just getting, they're getting annoyed with the the voting system itself. Um, And then you've got the rise of these sort of minor parties as well now um, where like the Liberal Democrats are getting seats um, and they're, you know, a centre-left party reforms, getting some seats, they're far right. Because of this, you know, first past the post style of voting, they could potentially get a number of seats as well. There are no preference flows. So I don't know, in terms of the sort of mood here, it's very, I would say, considering um, how big the change is, uh, you know, from Conservative to Labor, you know, for the first time in 14 years, the mood really doesn't seem to be that excited. <laughs> <laughs> is it the, uh, the, maybe it's just the stiff upper lip Brits, they, uh, you know, keep on, what is it? Keep calm and carry on. They're not going to make a fuss about it. Look, before we let you go, Eleanor, uh, and the answer to this might be no changes at all, but what can we expect to happen with the UK's relationship with Australia? Is Keir Starmer going to take forward any sort of different foreign policies that might impact us down under? Uh, the main thing about Keir Starmer is he said he's going to support AUKUS. So that's always good for us. Uh, It would be really, really bad if he said he didn't. Uh, I think I get the sense that uh, Keir Starmer's really focused on strengthening the relationship with Europe. So I think before, you know, the Conservative Party was starting to look to the Commonwealth a bit more after Brexit. And, you know, it's part of why we have, you know, the free trade agreement uh, now. But I get the sense that Keir Starmer is going to be trying to focus more on Europe. I mean, having said that, there's also been some talk about uh, graziers here not loving the Australian and uh, New Zealand beef exports and lamb exports coming here and, you know, undercutting their prices. Although I've sort of seen, I guess, mixed articles on that, on whether that's actually really something that people are worried about or not. Um, So I guess that's sort of what's happening in terms of Australia. But I, yeah, I think that generally, I don't think too much is going to change on that front. Well, we appreciate you staying up so late to chat to us. I'm sure you were watching the results anyway, but thank you for making the time to join us again. We miss you very much. Thank you so much for your time, Eleanor. No worries. See ya. That was Sasha speaking with The Briefing's former senior producer, Eleanor Harrison-Dengate. And just before you go, I wanted to let you know about another one of listeners' podcasts. Season three of former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull's podcast, Defending Democracy, dropped yesterday. This season is all about the US election. And you can listen to episode one, Does America Need a Democracy Sausage, wherever you get your podcasts. And make sure you check your feed tomorrow for Antoinette's chat with Poe Ling Yao on The Weekend Briefing with her amazing story about going from contestant to judge on MasterChef. I'm Ben Sion Siebert. Catch you next time.